I want to start back at the beginning. What's the beginning? Genesis. Genesis. It's the book of beginning. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. Yeah. Amen. Genesis chapter 1. Glory to God. Verse 26. So we're going to talk about winning, being victorious. Verse 26. Then God said, who said? Uh Uh-huh. Let us, the Godhead, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Say dominion. dominion. Over the fish of the sea. Now, let me tell you, this is not just speaking in just random phrases. There was truly a dominion over the fish of the sea. Now, I'm not talking tuna in your can, the fish of the sea, the chicken of the sea, or what do you call it? It's a fish of the, yeah, whatever it is. Uh, you know, I got, I could have dominion over canned fish, but he's not talking about tuna in the can or, or fi- I mean, salmon in the can. I'll get it right in a minute. Uh, he's not talking about, you know, you go to the market. There's really some authority over the fish of the sea. And uh, some of you fishermen ought to get a, a revelation on that. Uh, the fish of the sea had dominion. I believe he meant that over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them. What did God do? What's another word for it? Empowered. And God empowered them and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, have dominion, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Every living thing that, that's except for human wills. You can't have dominion over, over human wills. All right? So let's settle that up front. Uh, you don't have dominion over someone else's will. So the quicker you learn that, the happier you're going to be. But he said here... God said, we're going to make man after likeness in our image. And the plan was that they have dominion. Now, I hear a lot of people talking about, we're the church of Jesus Christ. We have dominion. But when I look around at the body of Christ as a whole, you don't always see dominion from side to side. You may see pockets of it. But we have been given true dominion. True dominion. And he tells us how we got it. 28, God blessed them and then God said. So it would have been unjust in God if he would have just said be fruitful. If he would have said multiply, fill the earth, subdue and have dominion without empowering you to do it. So God empowered us to have this from the very beginning. Just because Adam failed and Adam sinned, God already had a way to bring everything back into order through Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible called Jesus in the Corinthians the second Adam. The first Adam, we lost it all. Through the second Adam, we got it all back. Or I like to put it this way. What God did through Jesus, the second Adam, was far greater than what the enemy was able to do through the first Adam. By causing him to fall. He redeemed us back to the original state. Only God can restore you back to the, re- re- you know, the original state. We had years ago the very first uh, car show out here we had. We invited people to come and there was different things given out. And I preached that Sunday after that Saturday you know, about restoration. God restored things back to us. Now, there 
There are people that restores houses. They restore old cars. They restore trucks. Uh, Kathy's two sons, which was best friends of Scott growing up all their life, they like the old General Motors, GMC, Chevy trucks back in, what, what years are they like? 48 to 54. And they've got good at it. I mean, not only do they restore them, they sell them for a very good price and they just keep doing it. But the truth is, you got to get remanufactured parts to restore it to make it look like that because you can't go back and get the original goods. The cloth they put in that headliner back in, back in the late 40s, early 50s, it's not there anymore. If it was still there, it would be as rotten, you know, as the original one was there. So they can make it look like, they call it restored, but they put in a better motor, you know, better this, better that, because very profitable. But you cannot take it back to the original because the original stuff don't exist. But when Adam sinned and fell and man was separated, God did not restore us back to something man made. He took us back to the original. He restored us back the way we were pre-fall. That's very important. So that means we don't have something that looks like the pre-fall. He was able to restore us back to that place. So everything that Adam had, the dominion Adam had, the authority Adam had, everything that God put in man and said, this is the way I want man to live, and they lost it through the fall, the second Adam brought us back and restored us back to that original state. He restored us back to the original state. It wasn't just secondhand man-made parts that look like it. This was the original state of God created man. Am I making sense to you? This is the original. So what we look like on this side of the cross after Jesus died, what we have now, we can go back and look at and say that's what God's original plan was. It's like the book that you had that we gave out. And if you're in the class that Scott uh, monitors and, and uh, leads. There's a book by David Barton and them called The Original Intent. So regardless of what's going on, they take it back to the original intent of our constitution. Everything we have, the original intent. So what Jesus did when he came, he took us back to the original, God's intended way of living in the attended way of dominion and authority. So we don't have a second place dominion, nor do we have a second place authority. We went back to the original plan and structure of God. Now, I believe heaven would rejoice if God's people would continue. Because remember, Jesus is now the head. We are still the body. So it's the body of Christ that's functioning up on the earth and we as a body ought to function the way that the body functioned before it was crucified in full victory. Come on. Jesus was the head and the body here. But when he died, he remains our high priest, the head of the church, and now we are his body up on the earth. And how many knows God intended for his people to live victorious having dominion, being able to be fruitful and everything that goes with it. So God wants us to continue to live in this state of victory. I really believe God wants his people to live victorious all the way through. Now I realize we have challenges, but it's victory that we are to live through. So let's just kind of work our way through. I'm going to read some verses and then I'm going to get down to uh, some spot to really talk about. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the book of Remembrance, chapter 20. Read these again this morning. Hallelujah. 
I'm just going to start at verse 1 in uh, chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. When you go out to battle against your enemies, do we still have an enemy? Yes. But let me tell you, before he was your enemy, he was God's enemy. This is Lucifer. This is the enemy. There's only one Satan. Only one Satan. There's only one. There's devils. Because when Lucifer, that became Satan, Lucifer, a high-ranking cherubim, angel, like, that was in heaven, decided because of being lifted up in pride, I'm going to exalt my throne above God's. I'm going to outpower God. And he was cast out. And the revelation makes it very clear that when that dragon was kicked out, he took his tail and took one-third of the heavenly host, the angels with him. Those fallen angels became evil spirits. It's the, rich, it's the intent. It's where the origin of it was. So Satan in his army of invisible forces was one third of the heavenly host. And we don't know exactly how many that one third is, except Satan himself, Lucifer himself is not like God. He's not omnipresent. God's omnipresent. He's everywhere. If Satan literally manifests himself as Satan, he could not manifest himself in Eaton and Lewisburg at the same time. But his the demon spirits that are assigned to attack different people, assigned to attack the church, assigned to bring people down, these evil spirits, I mean, I, they're, they're, uh, I, I don't know how you number them, except for what God said, what the Word of God declares inspired by God, according to the prophet, and that is there's more that be for us than there is for them. So if only one-third was able to be deceived out of heaven, it remained two-thirds. And I'll take two-thirds over, I'll take take two-thirds over the one-third that fell. So that means there's more for us. Angels take charge. There's more for us than there is for them. Amen. So I don't see a defeat anywhere in the word of God. I don't see a defeat. All right. So we all have an enemy. And, uh, This thing about the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. Come on. If God can't make you do it, how's the devil going to make you do it? Does the devil outrank God? No. Jesus laughed with the disciples and said, I saw him fall like lightning to the earth. No. If God can't make you do it, why why does people say the devil made me do it? The devil can't make you do anything. Come on. All right. Let me get on my reading. He says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and see horses and chariot and people more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Remember, don't be afraid. If I can bring you up out of Egypt, I can take care of this situation. So it shall be when you are on the verge of battle that the priest shall, uh, shall uh, uh, approach and speak to the people. So I noticed the first thing is going to happen, the priest, the man of God is going to come and share. Why? Faith should come when the word of God is preached. All right. And she'll say, hear, O Israel, today you're on the verge of the battle with your enemy. Do not let your hearts faint. Do not be afraid. Do not. And, and do not trouble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God, verse 4, is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemy to save you. Number one, God will always be there. No, you will never be alone. I'm just so alone. I feel so alone. That's your emotions. If you're born again, you're never alone. I mentioned this the other day. Right before I close in prayer, I've said this from the time I got it in my heart. I don't think I've ever, ever prayed it again. And that is, I hear people pray, you know, before they leave, I'll be in different services, different events. Father, I pray that you go with us and that, that you be with us as we leave this place. I mean, what, you think God's going to stay here at the church while you go home today? I got to ask God to go with you. No, he lives in you. 
Now, I have the right to say angels take charge because he said he'll give his angels charge, but I'm not going to pray. God, you know, as we dismissed, I pray that you go with each one, that you go with us to our homes. No, he's going to go with you. He's going to be with you through the good and the bad. Come on. I've never prayed again. God, I pray that you go with us. It's impossible for me to go without God because God dwells in me. Come on. It's impossible for me to go without God. But it's amazing how, how people get into a religious mindset. God, I pray that, that, that you go with them. And I, when I got to thinking about that, I'm thinking, you know, there's nothing faith about that. There's not even anything scriptural about that. He always goes with me. Matter of fact, he goes before me. The Bible is very clear. He goes before me. He makes the crooked path straight. I don't have to ask God to, to, to go with me. I don't have to beg God as I prayed this morning down here. I'm not a dog. I don't beg. I don't have to beg God and, and this and that. God is ready because he's already made a way for us. Amen. So if God's going to go before us, if he made this plan, he intends for us to be in victory in this. He intends for victory. One of my favorites, Psalms 108. Come on. Hallelujah. Love Psalm 108. It's one of your favorites, isn't it? Hallelujah. Psalms 108. There's another verse similar to it. Verse 13. You've heard me quote this many times. Through God we shall do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. Glory to God. That means you shall do violently. You shall live in victory on this. You shall live in victory on this. Amen. That's, that's who you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to get to New Testament here. Uh, these are just good texts for you to underline and write down. This is ammunition. We're, we're loading your spiritual gun right here. 1 Corinthians First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to go right to verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. So if you understand your position in him, then you understand that God is setting you up for victory. I love victory. I don't like losing. I, I'm just competitive as everybody else. I do not like losing. I do not like losing. I think losing is terrible. Uh, I agree with Dale Earnhardt Sr. Sec- second place is the first loser. There is nothing about, there's nothing about losing that I like. I don't like to lose. Now, I'm a good sport. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it when I'm driving around. I see a parking spot up close. By the time I make my circle, somebody else got it. But I don't get in the flesh over it. Angel pulled into someone's parking spot on Black Friday and a person spit at her. Huh? And it reached her. You know, I'm a righteous man. Huh? But I think... I would have had a major issue with that. Any men here say amen? amen? I mean, you know, spit on me, spit on my wife. Anyway, don't get me in the, in the spirit. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter two. Second Corinthians chapter two. I've quoted this over and over as well. Verse 14, now thanks be to God who always, the King James says who always causes us to triumph. But the new King James says, thanks be unto God who always leads us in triumph. He leads us. How many knows he goes before us in victory? 
He leads us in triumph in Christ. See, this is that positional truth. This is like it ties into last week. You can't get to it all in one thing. In him. See, if you do it in yourself, you're going to be defeated all the days of your life. But if you take that position in him, he will always lead you. He will always lead you. So thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through and through us diffuses the, the fragrance of his knowledge in every, in, in every place. So here, I wrote down a more modern thing here. It said, in the Messiah, in Christ, God leads us from place to place in a perpetual victory parade. Amen. A perpetual victory parade. Amen. A perpetual victory parade. He leads us from place to place in a perpetual victory parade. So that means from this place, if we go from glory to glory, from this place to that place, he leads us. He goes before us in a perpetual victory parade. Amen. I like it. How many likes parades? You know, there's good parades. I've seen a lot of good parades. And I've seen some bad parades. You know, but I like the ones that's good all the way to the end. I like the ones that's good all the way to the end. But he leads us from place to place in a perpetual victory prayed. God never intended for you to go from struggle to struggle. He intended you to go from glory to glory. Yes. You know, there ought to be a fragrance about God's presence around you. People ought to know that you've been with God. People ought to know that you've been with God because there's something about God that's a fragrance about you. Uh, now, before I was in ministry full time, while I was here as associate, I still worked in drywall and I had drywall mud all over me. But you can't smell drywall mud. You can't say, Dad's home, I smell the mud. There's no smell of drywall mud on you. I mean, I may be covered. The better I got, the less I got on me. You know, when I first started, they let me know we're paying for that mud to go on the wall, not on your clothes. So eventually we had to balance that out. But I remember uh, once again, Scott making the statement that his dad being a tool and dive man, he had this special, this oil he worked in. But that he could tell because that oil smell was upon his dad. He could tell it was there. And so without seeing him, he knew that his dad would be home because of that fragrance. How many knows when you're with God, the fragrance of God ought to be on you? It ought to be on you. Because smells remind you of things. Smells remind you of things. It came up the other day, found out that Brendan Cologne is the cologne that I wore. And Maddie, oh my God, that smells like my dad. <laughs> I probably took the romance right off of it. That smelled like my dad because <laughs> anything you say in the pastor's home can and will be used against you in a sermon. <laughs> but the point is, smells remind you of things. I remember there was a there was a a hand soap that I loved. And it was a cheap soap, but it reminded me of the times I got to go to this this certain city pool. And that hand soap reminded me of that. And and every time I washed my hands, I thought about when I was a kid staying at my aunt's house going to that pool. Smells bring up remembrance, good and bad. Good and bad. And I'll tell you what, the fragrance of God. Once you understand it, you'll never want to be away from it. You'll never want to be away from it because the goodness of God is so great that you'll never want to be separated from it. Now, I want us to go, this is my main point today, and that is in 1 John uh, well, let's just go to let's 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 go to John first. Let's go back to the Gospel of John, and then then we're going to go to First John. Let's go back to. There's no sense me skipping it. We got time. John chapter sixteen. John chapter sixteen, and then we're going to go to First John. 
John chapter 16, verse 33. This is what Jesus said in red. If you don't have a red letter edition, you can write in it. This is in red. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Say, I have. That settles it. I have. I have. I have overcome the world. And if he has overcome the world, and if you're in him, then you're an overcomer yourself. The kids had this, and the kids on the move, they used to have a visitor called Rover Comer to represent overcomer. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. First John, with that in mind, let's look at First John. That's towards the back of the book. Hallelujah. Let me, uh, let's go to chapter two first. Chapter two, verse 12. I write to you, little children. Now that's adults too, all right? I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So because he overcame, you overcome. See, he's called a conqueror. And according to the Romans, you are called more than conquerors. That means you got the benefit without having to do the work. It's like they would... I heard this from the time I was young in church. It was always about Muhammad Ali back then. But Muhammad Ali would get into a boxing ring, get his brains almost beat out, they would say, not knowing where you're at for days afterwards, but he would win his $3 million check, and he was a conqueror. He was victorious. He comes home. His wife says, thank you. And she was more than an overcomer because she got the benefit without the pain. Come on. We get the benefit without going to the cross. He went to the cross so that you could have the benefit. Amen. It doesn't matter. People go through the Jesus carried it all so that we could have the benefit of it. He conquered and which made us more than conquerors in this. He made us more than conquerors, all right? Chapter five. Don't don't leave me yet. Chapter five. Let's just start verse one. I'm only gonna read, I'm only gonna read four, four verses. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. Let me read that again. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one who loves him, who begot also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandment. For this is the love of God that we this is, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome to us. Verse four, for whatever is born of God or whoever, it doesn't matter, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the, say it loud, that overcomes the world, even our faith or our faith. 
Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So this is the victory that overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world. So I looked up that word years ago. This is the victory, and I, I brought it out here, but it's been like way back, I think it was 14, the last time I looked at this here. This word victory, even in the Greek, you can look it up in the Greek. It, the victory is the Greek word Nike. That is where they get it. See, originally, Nike, it was like some kind of a uh, Grecian goddess, which meant to subdue, to conquer, to overcome. And so the Greek word for victory is the word Nike, N-I-K-E, Nike, it's in the Greek. You look it up. You go to the Strong's and go to this verse and look it up and you'll find it. So notice that everything built around the Nike Corporation is all about living in victory and overcoming. So when it says this is the victory that overcometh the world, this is the Nike that overcometh the world, and everything that is based upon that, even in that secular realm, even though it could be a liberal organization supporting all the liberal issues, they understood that this name is going to represent victory, conquest, to conquer. They did a survey of athletes, blue chip athletes, high level athletes coming out of, coming out of high school. And they asked them, what is one of the biggest deciding factors of what school you signed with? One of the top answers were, we wanted to go to a school that already was sponsored by Nike. Because it already sets us up for success. Greater than uh, Adidas, greater than uh, Under Armour. They said Nike was the one who set them up for that. And I'm thinking, can you imagine people making a decision based upon a logo, a symbol. Why? Because it proved success. It proved victory. It proved major contracts. It proved a lot of stuff that's going on. And when the Bible says this is the victory that overcometh the world, there is something in you that's already been put in you in him that makes you victorious from the very beginning. You may feel like a failure, but you're not. There's only one thing worse than being wrong, and that's... There's only one thing worse than being defeated, and that's living in defeat. Don't ever allow things to defeat you. Don't ever allow things to dominate you. If I had time, I'd tell you my milkshake story, but I don't have time to tell it. But don't ever allow things to dominate your life. Well, I went through a tough situation in my life. And when it comes to this time of the year, I just, I just kind of go into my own little bubble. I just kind of withdraw. I, I, I go into this little bit of depression because of what happened. Don't allow that to happen. You are victorious from head to toe, top to bottom. Quit allowing these things to defeat you. You are already defeated. This is the victory that overcometh that situation. Even your faith. Don't allow that to happen. Don't allow it to happen. I know people have gone through tragic events. I know people have gone through tragic situations. But don't allow that past tragic to keep you out of living in victory today. I can show you verse after verse from Genesis all the way through Revelation. It's God's will for his people to live in victory. Come on. You may go through things, but you don't have to live in that. Come on. You may go through trials and temptations, but you don't have to live in that area. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even your faith. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. What concerns me? When people separate themselves from the word, they separate themselves from victory. So to me, it's not about attendance. Who's here? Who's not here? It's about who's living in victory and who's living in defeat. can't stand for God's people to live defeated and get down every time of a certain part of the year because of remembrance. I'm not saying it may not be the most tragic time of your life, but you don't allow that past tragic event to keep stealing the victory that you have in him. 
you keep moving forward. You keep stepping in this. You keep stepping. You make yourself walk in this. You make yourself live in this. I see people. I remember every, every year, Terry Myers, his one son that was killed in that accident. He was supposed to go on that next mission trip with him. The story was he told his son, he says, I don't think you should go tonight out hunting. But he was in that bad accident and he died. And Terry says, there's not a, there's not a time goes by or especially the date goes by, that that doesn't get him in the gut. But then, then he goes on to say, he says, but I'm never allowed that to stop me from can you continue to do. Because through God, he said, the, the memory, the hurt may never be taken away, but I'm never allowed it to be an excuse for me to give up from doing what I'm going to do. I've never faced that. I pray to God I never. I pray to God that no one else, if you've been through it, you never, you never do it again. There's people here that's lost children, younger and older. But the point is, let God bring healing to you. Let God bring healing to you. Don't live in that hurt and defeat. Let God bring healing to you. Let God bring healing to you. He created you to have dominion. He created you to be victorious. He didn't create you to be defeated. Let God bring healing to you today. I want you to stand with me.